Welcome back to Countdown. I'm Manus Cranny. As we've been saying, it is HSBC. The earnings are out a little bit later. Europe's largest bank. Uh, joining us from Zurich to break down the numbers is the Dean of Robert Kennedy College, David Costa. David, great to have you with us this morning. Um, a great deal has been made of where HSBC stands relative, relative to its peers in terms of litigation costs. I mean, do, do you join that ban that the litigation costs will fall dramatically relative to where we were last year? I think, uh, yes, I think the litigation costs are something we have to watch out very carefully, and there will be a drop. Now, how considerable the drop must depend if the provision for the PPI issue, which just came up also this morning, is sufficient or not, because the provision they have set apart, apart aside so far for the PPI is a bit lower than other banks. So there is where there's going to be a bit of interpretation of the numbers and to see if the existing provision, which is already fairly substantial, will be sufficient or not. But uh, despite that, I think we are reaching the end of the tunnel, so to speak, about litigation in the case of HSBC. The model has already changed. There have been a lot of uh, things going on in the past, and I don't see big surprise in the future. There is already this big provision for the PPI. There might be an add-on there, but it's still going to be temporary, and the big chunk of the litigation problem is probably behind at this stage. David, take me forward. Stuart Gulliver has been reviewing a lot of businesses, um, divesting, etc., trying to hone down what HSBC is going forward. What, what should it be going forward? What, what's your view from what you've looked at? Well, I think, first of all, in every bank where you have a change in the business model, like we had here, we had cost, uh, cost saving, we had 40,000 uh, less employed in investment banking, we had 5 billion cost saving per year. When we have all those changes, uh, the business is likely to take a bit of an adjustment period, like it is now, because we have several challenging environments for HSBC, uh, not just in, in China and the situation in investment banking, but also in some of the South American markets. So being a global bank, you're going to be inevitably exposed to a lot of situation at the moment. That said, as soon as the business starts to focus more, and we have things like commercial banking, like probably in Hong Kong, they're going to have better margin at this point, where things start to go the right way. So there is always an adjustment when a lot of the business has been cut off. Like last year, we had extra earnings concerning a lot of business which have been sold, and we're not going to have this this year, so we're going to see a reduction in earnings here. But over the long term, I think it was the right thing to do to focus, because much of the model of these global bank which does everything is no longer applicable, especially with the new rules of how much money you have to set aside for things like investment banking and trading. For that reason, I think they are doing all the right things, just it might take a bit longer than expected to see the fruits of those changes. David, it's Caroline Hyde in London. How long until we see the fruits from Asia, of course, about 40% of the revenues for HSBC? Will we see Asia start to bottom and bear these fruits in the future? I think so. I think HSBC has a good exposure in Asia, not as much as other banks, so it's still feel fairly global, fairly balanced. And in Asia, we had low growth at the moment, but there's going to be a rebound there as well. So I think it's actually seeing how the world is going is a good place to be, as opposed to be more concentrated in, in markets like Europe only. So the diversification they have is pretty much good. We had a challenge situation in Asia, which is not bound to continue forever. So I see they have well positioned there. Already we're going to see in Hong Kong probably some improved margin in commercial banking, and that's probably going to be in other sectors as well. The big challenge remains, in my opinion, investment banking overall, because that's a very, very challenging environment for every bank in this market, and possibly HSBC will further slow down the, their exposure there. But in other situations, they already um, cut their exposure in risky markets, including Russia, for example, where HSBC already sold their business there uh, some time ago. And that's, I think, another positive to be concentrated on the areas where there are more chances to get good revenue in the future. David, let's look ahead to Standard Chartered also releases this week and it's already, it's already issued a profit warning for the first half of the year. Well, when, you, when you put HSBC there and Standard Chartered there, how do you compare the two lenders, both heavily exposed to emerging markets? 
Well, my first uh, ratio for comparing is really the capital they have, the tier one capital ratio on HSBC. It is better than standard charter, and that's my first ratio. The second um, way I look at it is uh, how much exposure they have to a single market, and, and, and standard charter is, is much more exposed to Asia, is less global, much less global than HSBC. So among the two, I look at capital first because the new banking environment requires a lot of capital. Regulators are out to ask for more and more capital depending on which part of banking you're working at. So between the two, I see a situation more positive, slightly ahead of HSBC. This doesn't mean that Standard Charter wouldn't be a good investment, just they are slightly behind this renewal process, which HSBC has already undertaken and is a couple of steps ahead. David, I've got to ask you about Banco Espirito Santo. It's the big banking story of the day here in Europe. Uh, for those who don't know, Portugal's central bank has taken control of the lender after pumping almost 5 billion euros into it. Does this draw a line in the sand underneath the bank and Portuguese banks' troubles, David, or not? I don't think it draws a real uh, line in the sand, but what it tells is that in this case the government has been very prompt on acting, and that's certainly a positive for the banking sector in Europe to see that now there is this quick intervention without too much disruption. But that said, it's also on the other side a bit uh, symptomatic of uh, seeing that the, the, the evolution of the banking sector is not over yet, and there might be some other surprises there. That's why I say it's not really yet a line in the sand. We don't know. It was a bit of a surprise to see that all those accounts didn't match at the end and that's I think the, con the concerning side is really uh, that's why a lot of investors want to stay away from banking still because there is so much opacity still there which uh, we have to be careful still in some of the institution of course they're gonna be institution which are ahead which has done a lot of reforms and where their situation is much more transparent than others but there isn't yet a complete clarity in all the European banks David, with that in mind, it's Manus. Uh, to finish, we've got the asset quality review coming up. Which banks are you most concerned about uh, as you look around Europe? You see that this pop, this came from nowhere, uh, this Espirito Santo story. Where are you worried? Where are you most concerned about, David? Well, that is exactly the problem. I think every investor is concerned uh, without a specific name because you don't know where the next story is going to come up. What I'm less concerned, I can tell you about, is perhaps some of the Swiss banks because I think that the reform here has been much faster than in other countries. They've been much faster on seeing, on having this mindset to say we focus on few areas where we are very strong, including wealth management. And so I think uh, I'm more positive to, for example, some of the Swiss banks versus some of the other European banks. But that's my view of how the reform has been faster here due to different regulation and higher capital ratio than some of the banks here present compared to their counterparts in Europe. Good man, David. That'll go down well with Sergio Motti and Brady Dugan round the corner from you there. David Costa, uh, Dean of Robert Kennedy College. 621 in London, no easing for now. As